for what's going on with Compton. I want to know what's photoelectric. Let's go. Come on. With tungsten? Um, tungsten. Well, it's the uh, material. Okay, it's tungsten. Oh, tungsten. 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 Yes. But thank you, though. Compton. Oh, well, Compton, it, it has three things. We have it's absorbed by the patient, it's absorbed by the tip, or it's um, on its way to the IR. Okay, good. Um, that's how I see Compton interaction. And then... Yes, you're right. That's how I see Compton. Right. And then... Okay, we call those byproducts, right? Byproducts of that interaction, meaning you have to have yes. that interaction first in order to have those byproducts. Okay, those are byproducts. That's a result of. Good. Photoelectric absorption. Ruth. Oh, yeah. Tell me about tell me one thing about photoelectric absorption. Uh, uh, in the photoelectric absorption, uh, the electron is absorbed absorbed. The electron? By the K uh, the photo. The photo. Okay. It's absorbed by the K shape. By the K shell. So once it tries to go to that inner shell electron, most of the time it is going to deposit all of its energy or transfer all of its energy. And then, then what emerges after that? Wani, tell me what emerges after that pho incident photon and photoelectric effect or absorption deposits all of its energy. What happens? What emerges from that atom? What now possesses a photoelectron? A photoelectron, that is his name, his or her name. All right, or its name to be more accurate. Perfect, good. What else have we learned? What else have we talked about in this chapter that's been essential? Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about classical, uh, classical scatter. What is it, Pamela? Classical. Classical, um, classical scatter is um, when an incident photon enters, um, it has a low energy and um, it does not ionize. It doesn't. It excites, doesn't it? Yeah. That's the only interaction that we're going to have over the five that we're talking about that will excite. It does fall within our, some of it falls within our lower end of our spectrum of our diagnostic range, very, very low end. Um, and then the other two that we're going to briefly talk about today are going to be on the higher end or not even on the higher end of our spectrum. It's going to be outside of our range. Okay, way on the higher energy side. So we don't deal with it, but does does not mean we don't see it, and I'll explain in just a moment. Okay, what else have we talked about? I feel like we've talked about a lot in this chapter. Uh, we've talked about hands together. Mm -hmm. Isn't uh, it's a low energy photon, right? Which one? Uh, coherent scatter. Yeah, coherent or classical or Thompson scatter has all those three names. It goes by all, all those aliases. So whether I put Thompson scatter, whether I put uh, coherent, or whether I put classical, they all mean the same. All three of those do the same thing. They excite. They excite the electrons. They don't ionize the electron. Okay, good. All right. What are the two things that emerge out of a Compton interaction, Aurora? We already talked about <laughs> the byproducts of one of them. But what two things emerge out of the away from the atom and Compton interactions, Aurora? You may Can I help her? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if she couldn't mute. Go ahead. It was secondary photon and Compton electron. The secondary photon, or the okay, those also emerge. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess there's three things. The secondary photons, depending, secondary. when does the secondary photon, uh, when does the secondary photon happen in Compton interactions, Justly? Whenever there's like a vacancy, it, ha it 
it goes down like the electrons go to the okay so let me let me let me put it in a little bit more so that you can give me the correct or accurate answer so an incident <laughs> photon comes in and knocks out what kind of electron in order to ignite or initiate a secondary photon response wait is it, is it a middle shell oh electron, yeah. or is it an outer shell electron middle shell has to be because you have to have a vacancy in an inner shell in order to have a drop down. Mm -hmm. Secondary photons do not happen if the initial or incident photon struck an outer orbit electron. Does everyone understand that? So secondary photons only emerge when there was an opportunity for cascading. Okay, so we're going to kind of put that one down. Yeah not too much on the secondary photons so name the two again what emerges out of the atom on a compton interaction the compton electron compton electron is one and the character not the name for that one not the characteristic characteristic and secondary mean a drop down had to happen it's in the name oh the compton. compton oh the interaction oh, compton. A Compton. Compton electron and a yeah. Compton photon. Photon, that's what it was. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, Compton photon and a Compton electron. Secondary or characteristic only happens when you have a middle shell orbit ionized and a drop down happens. Good. Perfect. All right. So I think we have the gist of it. Do we have any questions before we move on? No? Okay. So we had an opportunity to talk about relationships. Before we move on, I want to talk about relationships. Amy, when we talk about directly proportion, what does this mean? All these arrows. What does this what does it mean? My arrow is one side of the equal sign is up, the other side is equal sign up. What does that mean? And 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 in relationships. Um, from what I recall from last class, um, we did the example of KV, KVP going up and also uh, the Compton scatter going up. Yes, and so we know when KVP goes up, Compton is going to also go up. So directly proportional, thank you, Amy, you did it wonderfully. Variables that on one side increase will be matched with an equal increase or opposite. If they decrease, if the KVP goes down, then Compton goes down. Same, if KVP goes up, then Compton goes up. Give me another example of directly proportional, any one of what we've talked about this semester. Uh, MA go up, beam quantity go up. So if MA goes up, beam quantity does go up. Thank you, Sharon, same, same. Same um, circumstance. If MA goes down, then beam quantity goes down. Perfect. Somebody else give me something else because you're going to see this. Uh, KVP goes up as well as transmission. Transmission also goes up. Yes, absolutely. When KVP goes up, the probability of transmission also goes up. Perfect. Give me something else. I know there's more out there. Um, MA increases, so the beam quantity increases as well. Good. We have that one. What about quality? What happens when beam quality goes up? What has to, what, what controls beam quality? KVP. So what would you put it in that form as Betty? When, when so K KVP goes up, beam quality. The beam quality goes up. Very good. So now let's talk about inversely proportional. When you have a variable that increases, the opposite effect happens on the other side of that equal sign. So when something increases, the reaction is opposite. That is called inversely proportional. Inversely proportional. So what have we talked about where we can use or we've seen inversely proportional? KVP and photoelectric. Photoelectric absorption, right? Yes. So tell me about it. Put it in one of these. Put it in either one of these. Either when increase K or decrease. 
when um, KVP goes up, then photoelectric goes down. Photoelectric absorption probability goes down. So we're going to look at, thank you, Esbedi, that was awesome. So we're looking at these relationships. We're able to describe how one, the, the, the cause and effect correspond with each other. So good. I love relationships. So let's get through pair production. Pair production happens, and everybody knows right here, and please make sure, this is in your book, this is not something that is going to be um, a secret, right here at the bottom of your screen, you have 1.02 MeV, million electron volts, or greater, in order to initiate a pair production response or interaction. So with that being said, it only occurs at a 1.02 MeV or greater energy range, okay? Still talking about x-rays, but on the higher end, higher spectrum, because we're in the thousand range, right? The thousand, the K. So when the x-ray photon has enough energy to escape interaction, it's not going to, it's not going to interact with any of these electrons it is going to, and we've had this type of interaction before where we were creating x-rays. What was the name of that where our, our incident photon, I mean, our incident electron came in and got really close to our nucleus. Does anybody remember that? And it changed directions after abruptly reducing its... Is it a brim? It is brim. So here we're talking about outside and patient matter here we have a very high energy incident photon now it has bypassed all of these electrons it will disappear inside of the nucleus this actual incident photon does interact with the nucleus it doesn't go around it it doesn't halt its energy. It actually interacts with the nucleus. Okay? So, once it interacts with the nucleus of the tissue, what is briefly, and they're still, we're still studying, um, scientists are still studying what is actually happening in this phenomenon, but what emerges afterwards are two particles. One is an electron that emerges from the nucleus and what is also called a positron. A positron is a positively charged electron. A positron is a positively charged electron. I know. This is also sometimes referred to antimatter. Okay, and so what happens? This is, so let's start from the beginning. Here we have a high energy incident photon. The photon interacts with the nucleus, no interactions with electrons. It disappears inside of the nucleus. At the same time, two particles emerge. One is an electron. And one is a positron, which is a positive charged electron. Okay, so this is what's going to undergo. You have two electrons, one positive, one negative, positron and electron. And what's going to happen? Each of these particles that exited the nucleus have a, 0.1, a minimum of 0.51 million electron volts. Where did we get that number? If you divide 1.02 by 2, you will come up with this number. So both positron and electron have energy. They have the energy of the original incident photon. So then what happens next? It's kind of like a story. Both particles travel out of the atom. With the electron, we know it, what's going to happen. We've been talking about electron interactions since the beginning of this chapter. We know that electrons are going to undergo many interactions until they expend all of their energy. 
right? We know that the electron is going to undergo any many, many interactions until all this energy is gone or transferred, transferred before it rests in another atom that has a vacancy in their outer orbital shell. Make sense? Yes? Perfect. All right. However, the positron is, un is going to undergo annihilation. The positron is going to undergo annihilation. It's going to act violently with other electrons. It is going to act violently with other electrons. And this is called an annihilation event. Okay, at the annihilation event, when you're having this type, let's go back to the image, when you're having this annihilation event between the positron and an electron, two photons will emerge from an annihilation event. Two photons will emerge from that annihilation event. Pair production does not, does not, occur in radiography. We do not have pair production in radiography. So where would we see pair production? We would see it in nuclear medicine. Nuclear medicine. We will see pair production in nuclear medicine. And when we get to photo disintegration, we will also see that in nuclear medicine or any of those um, uh, molecule type studies. Questions? No? All right. After the, uh, mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, after the annihilation event, does the positron just become just like an electron that, that goes and fills vacancies later on? Is like all, all of its energy is gone? Is that what it becomes? I think, well, since it's a positive, uh, it's a positive electron, I don't know to the point where what happens to it because it's still under investigation. Gotcha. But I, I'll continue to look because no really no resource eventually comes back and says, well, what the positron does, I'm assuming mm -hmm. it has to. Um, once it expends all of its energy and annihilation, I don't see that it disappears because it is still considered an electron. Mm -hmm. However, it's holding that positive charge that uh, that causes the annihilation. Mm -hmm. But I'll take a look and see if there's any type of nuclear medicine books that will give you a little bit more um, um, insight on annihilation. But this is one um, activity because they really don't know what happens inside of the nucleus in order for the antimatter, the antimatter to emerge. Um, so they're, they're still looking at it um, and that. In that aspect, but I'll, I'll okay. take it. I, I would think it just would. curious. It's a really good question. I would think it would, but I, I, I don't know. I'm not 100 percent on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Photo disintegration. This one is at a higher. At a higher. We're talking about 10 million electron volts. 10 million electron volts. Kind of like pair production. The incident X-ray is going to interact with the nucleus. However, it is not two particles that are going to emerge, such as the electron and the positron. It is going to be either a proton, a neutron, or an alpha particle. And photo disintegration, in order for the atom, the nucleus, to become stable after absorbing, after having that uh, incident um, photon that is greater than 10 million electron volts in order for it to stabilize itself it's going to undergo ejections of either protons neutrons or alpha particles so you can realize that this is going to change the chemical stability this is going to change the chemical stability of an atom does everyone understand what i mean by that No one? Can you explain it? I don't understand it. Okay. So 
what do we have inside of the nucleus, Amy? Uh, protons. Good. What do we have? In, what else do we have inside of a nucleus? Uh, new, no, neutrons and neutrons. Good. How many protons do we have inside of a tungsten atom? Seventy-four. If we got rid of one of those protons but didn't get rid of any electrons, what kind of charge would we have? Negative. Uh, wait. Say it again. If we got rid of the protons and the neutron, uh, the protons, what kind of atom would we have up now? Positive? Negative. Well, we have a positive or a negative? A negative. we got rid of a proton. Negative. Good. So does that start to change? Now, as atoms are identified in the periodic table by what? How many protons they have, right? Yes. So when you start to change the balance of protons versus how many electrons are there, you start to change the atomic makeup of it. Okay. It's one thing to get rid of an electron because another electron is going to come by, right? Especially under ionization and eventually settle. But you won't have another proton come by and eventually make this atom whole again. So once you have this type of energy absorption in the nucleus and you start ejecting particles, atomic particles, then you start to change what kind of atom it is. You can make it radioactive. Um, and that's what radioactivity does. And radioactive material, there is there is an ejection of particles that try to stabilize that atom. So that atom becomes highly unstable because of the change in proton number, neutron number, or alpha particle ejection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So photodisintegration is higher. It's not within our range. You can see 10 MeV, million electron volts. This does not happen. However, we do see this in radiation therapy. We will see photodisintegration in radiation therapy as well. Okay. Again, it does not occur in radiography. So I did want you to stick to the two uh, most common types of interactions within our diagnostic range, which is what again, doing. What is the two most common interactions within our diagnostic range? So we can repeat it again. The two types of common, the two most common interactions in our diagnostic oh range goodness. is what? Compton and what? Oh, one second. Mm -hmm. Compton and photoelectric interaction. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, good. So now we're on differential absorption. Does anyone have any questions about photo disintegration or um, pair production besides? John and and I'll go back and see if I can't find something on that. No, okay. So differential absorption, differential absorption. You really need to make sure that you read this area completely. You read this area completely because this is what we do. This is the balance. What we're basically talking about is all those interactions that are happening. All those interactions that are happening, but what do they really mean to us? We are we're talking about incident photons and we're talking about electrons being ejected. We're talking about um, secondary photons emerging. We're talking about byproducts. But what does this all really mean? What what is it? What does it do for us on our final product? What is our final product? What are we trying to achieve once we start or initiate? these interactions within people. Image. You are trying to achieve the image. So let's not forget we are trying to produce a quality radiograph while understanding what is happening inside the patient under our control for the most part. And we're so because we can control that we want to minimize patient dose. So when we think about differential absorption, we think about the way that the body is going to interact with the quality and the quantity of the primary beam. 
who gets to determine the quality and the quantity of the beam? Technologist. Technologist. Very good. Thank you. So when we're here, what is differential absorption? Different ways the body is going to absorb or not absorb. So photons that are absorbed versus those that don't get absorbed, that penetrate through the body. So different body structures absorb X-ray photons to different extents. We know that. Well, we're going to explore that section. So we're taking a look at this, this diagram. We have one, two, three, four, five, six photons that we're looking at here. Two of them did the same thing. Here is that symbol. We know that this is photons. They reached the image receptor. Two of them didn't. They intended to reach, right? They intended to reach the image receptor, but didn't. What happened here? Daniel, what's happening here? And bone here. Or something. It must have been bone or some type of object. The photons become uh, scattered radiation. Scattered. So this photon was intended to hit the image receptor, but it collided with a what kind of shell, Jalisha? What kind of shell? Electron? An outer shell. Outer? Okay. Outer shell electron. And it got deflected. So this photon is going to likely do what? Uh, John, what is this photon going to... It left the patient. It didn't reach the image receptor. So what else is it likely to do? Uh, it might interact with something else in the room or the tech. Technician. Very good. Absolutely. Good. So it didn't reach the image receptor. Had it reached the image receptor, what would we have called that? Uh, Sharon, had this photon reached the image receptor for OV here, what would we have called that? Um, when energy is deposited and will not represent the anatomic structure, it, this energy got deflected and is deposited elsewhere on the image receptor. What do we call that? Help her out, John. In. Image fog. Image fog. Perfect. Image fog. If the, if the uh, scattered photon still reaches the image receptor at a different area than intended, it is going to be image fog. It is not going to be a representative of what anatomical structure was here. It is not going to... Um, the word attenuate. Attenuate. Does anybody know what attenuate means? Is that part of your key terms? Attenuate. Have its energy level lowered? It has the energy level lower. Is it a, is it a key term in this chapter? I haven't. No, it's, it's, it's technically not a key term, no. I think it's, no. it's mentioned in one of them, though. Okay. I'm going to have to give you the definition. I'm going to have to give you the definition. I'll see if I can put it in Wednesday's slides. I have to give you the uh, a definition because of the word attenuation is going to be used so much, so much. Attenuation is where you have primary photon energy and either some of the energy, it's either attenuation, meaning that the energy gets absorbed or it gets reduced. So if the energy comes in and reduces any of its KEV, that is called attenuation. So it's either through absorption or as what we know, scatter. There is a total loss of, of energy or a reduction of energy that was once there. So when we say the word attenuation, but I will give you the formal um, definition so that we all understand what attenuation means. Okay. So what is happening here? Just wait. Look at these photons. They don't reach the image receptor. What happened? What interaction is that? Compton was scattered. These don't make it. 
unmute for me, Justly. Okay. What happens when an incident photon loses all of its energy? Um, okay, so it contributes to patient dose. Right? No, I want to know what interruption is this? Classical. Excite? No, not exciting. Hold on. It has to be. Remember, what, tell me the process in photoelectric absorption, the incident photon comes oh, it's in. Gonna absorb all the, it's going to absorb the electron. So it's going to... Absorb the electron? The inner, the inner, what's it? Is it the inner? The photon. Right? The photon. They're not the same, right? Yeah. It's like, you know what I mean. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can see, thank you, Justly. So we can see if this photon did not emerge in any form or fashion, we can clearly see that it was absorbed through photoelectric effect. So, why is this important? Why are we talking about all of these interactions? Because we have an x ray tube, we have a primary beam, and we have that primary beam that is going to interact with tissue. Inside of the human body, it's a collage. It is a composition. We have bone. We have muscle. We have air. We have water. We have soft tissue. We have a composition of many, many different things, different elements, different atoms, trillions upon trillions. Okay, so here we are. Here's our primary beam. Our primary beam is going to have various energy levels. We know that. Various energy levels. So if we set high, we know we're going to roughly go to about how much Jolie, what value will composite most of our photon energy in the primary beam? What is the fraction of the highest KVP that we, we set? I'm sorry, but I don't remember. One third, per, one third, one third. one third of the value. So we know we have different energies that are going to interact with tissue differently. So here we have a radiograph of the chest. Now we know as we're looking at the different colors, we know what was here because we see an outline. What is this an outline of, Wani? It's a radio loose in the lung. It's a lung, right? And we have mm -hmm. Tiwani, and we know that this radio lucent material of the lung is going to allow X rays to pass through easily and reach the image receptor. However, right here we have a outline of something else. It's not lung because we can see the outline of lung. What is this an outline of right here? Um, Luke. The heart. The heart. And what is the heart made of that allowed some of the x-rays to be absorbed? Tissue. Muscle. Tissue. Muscle. <laughs> Dense, dense heart muscle tissue, right? And then what is this? Thank you, Luke. What is this, Marcella? What am I pointing at right here? Bone. Bone, scapula, right? So it kind of takes on the same appearance and color as we have in the kind of in the heart area because when we start thinking about tissue on top of tissue on top of tissue certain density how dense that tissue is meaning how fibrous how movable is it versus how movable or thinner we're going to look at those so the primary beam is going to interact with the body's parts composition differently however it is going to leave in its wake an outline of what it went through make sense and not only that 
the color will tell us what was there. So when we look at this image here, we have different, oops, we have different composites of the body, okay? So in this glass test tube, we have bone, water, fat, and air, right? So we have bone, water, tissue, and air. There's a lot more to us besides these four items, but this is the majority. We know that we're made of 80 to 85% of water. So there's a lot of water inside, right? So we know that. Okay, so here, the same x-rays, the same x-rays that went through here and down here are the same. It's a polyenergetic or various energetics, uh, energy photons, and it penetrated or exposed this entire test tube of items. However, the interaction of the material inside of the test tube with the x-rays behaved differently. This is what we call differential absorption. The way that the x-rays are interacting with the different types of composition in the body are going to give us an idea of what, an outline of what the x-rays interacted with. So what does this look like? Anyone? It's upside down too, by the way. Marker. This right here. Oh, a metacarpal. A metacarpal. Good job. A metacarpal. Very good. So we have a metacarpal that's right here. We see the water, right? We see the water. We can see the outline of the metacarpal because we know that the metacarpal is going to be more compact than the water. Depending on how compact the water is, it is going to be a lot more solid and compact. So the bone behaved, the x-rays behaved differently with the bone than they did the water around it. Make sense? So the brighter the area is, is an indication that the material was very dense. It was strong, it was compact, it was immovable. Make sense? Yes? No? What's going on? No one's talking. I'll wait. We all understand? Thumbs up? Thumbs I can't see. You guys are just staring. Are, is my microphone on still? Okay. All right. So fat. Fat is loose tissue. Fat is very loose tissue. It is loose. It has movement to it. So it is less compact than bone. It can take on a different shape depending on where you place it. So because this tissue is very loose, it is going to, and x-rays are going to interact differently than it did with bone. It is a lot, it's going to allow more what? Looking at the color. Com this compared to bone, it allowed more what? Transmission or absorption. Transmission. transmission. Perfect. Great. Definitely more transmission. And so here we have air trapped in this test tube. X-rays interacted with the air, and we know air is loose, right? Nothing close to compact at all. Air molecules are all around us. So here really didn't absorb any x-rays at all. Therefore, the appearance is black. When there is no absorption, it's black. We're going to say transmission. When there's no absorption, there is, it's purely transmission. Make sense? Questions? And then we have the marker or the metal. 
when we start using anatomic markers and that's for that reason so that we're able to have that right right area with your name with your initials at either on the left or a right to indicate that you're a student and who you are but we want the x-rays to be fully absorbed so we're able to see that anatomic marker that's why we choose metal so you're going to have that high high brightness or white appearance on the radiograph it will be an outline of those lead letters or metal letters inside of that plastic casing that you have make sense okay y'all are nodding yes but we shall see so transmission versus absorption transmission are those photons that pass right through they pass right through they pass right through this one is going to be a little bit different because it has a change in the symbol so we're going to talk about it again on attenuation so this transmission photon passed right through it did not lose it did not scatter it did not do anything it did not change got it so transmission photons are those x-rays that pass through the body and reach the image receptor without any deflection or any loss of energy. Please make sure you write that down. Okay. Absorption are the photons that are attenuated, attenuated, either absorbed or lost in the body and do not reach the image receptor. So this one is going to be considered, and now we're just going to, we're going to get to Compton later, but we're going to stick to transmission versus absorption. So transmission made it, the photon made it to the image receptor without losing any energy. Absorbed photon did not reach the image receptor and lost or converted all of its energy. Okay? We know this to be what kind of interaction? Photoelectric absorption. All right, so absorption has the opposite opposite inversely related inversely related to what is transmission absorption and transmission are inversely related when absorption goes up transmission will go down when transmission goes up absorption will go down So what do we have on this diagram? We have our primary radiation beam. We have examples of what is being absorbed, right? And I want you to notice that the x-rays that are being transmitted through are going to deposit their energy on the image receptor. The x-rays that do not pass through will be bright, bright spots on the radiograph. There will be bright spots on the radiograph. The void of the photons reaching the image receptor will leave bright spots on that radiograph. And we'll talk about why that is when we get to digital. Repeat that sentence more, please. Digital? The, the digital sentence? Or which? Oh, oh the, said, so no. you have an absorbed, an absorbed photon. Now, remember, we've opened up our primary beam to, encap to encapture this entire objective here. So we intended to radiate this entire image receptor. So when you do not have photons reaching the image receptor, it will leave a white or bright spot in that photon's absence.
Okay. So what about differential absorption? Well, it depends on not only KVP, because we know KVP is going to determine how strong these photons are, right? We know that KVP is going to go up. Transmission is also going to go up, right? And, and absorption goes down. Thank you, Naomi. So if KVP goes down, absorption goes Perfect. Good. So what else does differential uh, absorption depend on? Well, it depends on body tissue density. What does body tissue density mean? Whether it's muscle or bone, something like that. So how compact those cells are. How compact those cells are. Is it uh, fully compact like a bone? Or is it loose, like fat and water? So when you're thinking about tissue density, how compact is that tissue? How, how tight are those electrons next to each other in neighboring atoms? Is there space? Is there no space? So when we have high tissue density, then we're going to have these types of describers, radio opaque, radio lucent, body structures that readily absorb x-rays because x-rays have a difficult time passing through the compactness. They are more likely, because the tissue is so dense, it is more likely for the x-rays to be absorbed. Well, when the tissue is not so dense, very loose, the opposite of dense, loose, then you have what is called radiolucent. These are less dense structures that have much lower probability of absorption. X-rays are going to be able to pass more freely, less likely to get absorbed. This is important. Please put a star out and put a star here, but please... Put a star or, or get this down. You have to understand this. So why does a radio opaque look like that on a radiograph? Why does a radiolucent item or object look like that on a radiograph? Because we have more transmission and we have more absorption. Make sense? Or less transmission and less absorption. That's however you want to say it. the words can flip. So don't memorize it. The worst thing you can do in this class is memorize. It's about connecting concepts. Connecting concepts. And photons are not electrons. I think how many times have I said that already in just this chapter? Thank you. Photons and electrons are not the same. They're not interchangeable. They mean totally different. Mr. Donahue and Ms. Lara were not the same. Two totally different things. Got it? Good. All right. So, questions before I start moving on. Because on your exam, not only are you going to have to start defining relationships and looking at diagrams to tell me different types of interactions, I'm also going to put pictures of radiographs so that you can identify a radiolucent object versus a radio opaque. Got it? Yes? Good. So... This is basically what I said earlier, the lack of exposure of photon reaching the image receptor will result in a brighter shade on the image. A brighter shade. We know that. Okay, perfect. So we know that if photons get absorbed, they get stuck in the body, we should expect that there is going to be brightness around our radiograph. So, mm, Stephanie... What is the radio opaque object inside of this patient's abdomen? Can you make it out? Would it be the scissors? It is scissors. A 
absolutely scissors. We have scissors. This patient has scissors in their abdomen. So how do we know that they're scissors? Because the x-rays that interacted with this metal object were absorbed, leaving the outline for us to see. Are you starting to get an idea of what x-rays are and how x-rays are interacting with the body? Make sense? Tracy, what are these? Crest. How do we know that? Because... How do I know that this is bone? Uh, because of the absorption. The absorption. Thank you, Tracy. You made me happy today. Let's take a look at this radiograph here. There's a lot going on in these radiographs. We have this PD patient here, and I can tell it's a PD patient because I'm looking at epiphyseals right here. Epiphyseal plates. All right, but we have some high brightness here, John. What do you think these high brightness um, circular objects are in this? What type of element is what I'm looking for? What type of element are these circular items here? Metal? They metal? They look metal. So it kind of gives us an idea that this child swallowed, more swallowed something. Because this is not normally what we see inside of a our bodies. Make sense? So sometimes, whether it's scissors that are left behind from a surgical procedure, or whether it's a child being curious and swallowing objects, we are able to pinpoint where they're at in the body by doing our projections and seeing and locating them and determining what they are based on the interactions of x-rays. So we know, what am I pointing at right here, son? What is this up here? What is this an outline of? Uh, lungs, no. Lungs, good. Uh, yeah, no, and what no. is this organ right here? Don't leave. What is this no. organ right here? Diaphragm. The diaphragm is up here. What is this? I'll go a little bit lower. What is this organ? Liver. Oops, sorry. What is this organ? What organ? <laughs> body the liver. The liver. Good. So we know that the liver is going to interact with x-rays differently than colon, especially when the colon has air in it. Got it? So we know that colon is hollow a liver is not, and so the liver will not collect air. It is not a hollow organ. Good. So radiolucent objects. What does radio viewing radiolucent objects do for us? Well, let's, what is this a radiograph of? Let's see. Back to the front. Naomi, what is this a radiograph of? The abdomen. The abdomen. Is this patient erect or supine? Erect. Good. It is erect. And the reason why I know it's erect, not just because of that, but because we see these straight lines. And we know that air is going to travel to the highest point of the body. So if the patient were to lie supine, the air would travel to the anterior surface. Yes? Daniel, you have a question? No? Okay. So we know that the air is going to travel to the highest point. So what does this tell us? What does all of this air tell us? What do you think it could be a pathology when we start to see air in the small bowel? Obstruction. So sometimes when we see accumulation of small uh, of air in the small bowel and it is stuck somewhere, then we can usually start to see if it is a bowel obstruction, whether mechanical or non-mechanical, right? Remember that? Mechanical or non-mechanical? Maricela, are you with me? You remember that? 
different types of mechanical, right? Volvulas, uh, which one was another one? The fistula, uh, intussusception. Y'all remember those? Y'all are just staring at me now. I don't know what's going on. Where this is it. This is all I see. Talk to me. Can y'all hear me? Huh? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm almost done. So we're we're almost done. So let me go ahead and finish. Okay. So here we have. The radiolucent object. We have radiolucent objects here. We have air inside of the colon. We have air inside of the colon, which is very obvious. However, there is something else inside of this colon. And if you take a good look at the outline of these little pellets, we're going to go ahead and call them pellets. And when you start to take a closer look, you're able to see them because of the contrasting nature of these transmission and absorbed x-rays we're able to see the outline it's a lot clearer if you go down to where maybe there isn't any air to kind of show us they become a little bit more cam camouflage so what is it that i'm looking at that is very difficult to look at when there is the, the lack of presence of air and these are drug pellets being smuggled in by an individual who has swallowed over 50 pellets here. And like I said, we can see them more clearly when they are surrounded by a contrasting or transmission type interaction where we're able to see them a lot clearer. So radiolucency, such as air, can be used as a type of contrast, a contrast a way to either enhance tissue from the surrounding tissues so that we're better able to see. Okay, so radiolucent is going to give you what kind of appearances? Black. Yes, thank you. Good. So absorption, again, depends on the density of the body tissues through which the x-rays are passing. So not only the KVP, but we're talking about the tissue density. Could be atomic number, the compactness, the type of material, or how tight that tissue is placed on top of each other. So denser tissue, such as bone, increases the probability of x-ray photons being absorbed. And what type of interaction is that? That's called photoelectric. So what happens when the, the probability goes high or more absorption happens? The result is that fewer photons pass through the patient and reach the image receptor. What kind of appearance will that give us? Lighter, brighter. Body, body structures that readily absorb x-ray are called radiopaque type body densities, okay? Radiopaque, they don't allow x-rays to pass, more likely to absorb. Less dense structures have a much lower probability of absorption and are said to be radiolucent, such as water, air. Okay guys, I'm gonna stop there. I believe your test is on Friday, so on Wednesday we have a little bit less to go. I expect to do a review, but you know my reviews are basically all on you. All on you, okay? So I want to make sure that everyone gets their um, boost of energy to get ready for classes. So I'm noticing a lot of fatigue, so we got to do what we need to do to get the material, okay? Because we are fast and closing. Oh, before I let you go, um, I will be calling you in when you're doing your practicums. I need to go over your mid-semester evaluation as well as your grades. So if you are not as high or as far as you would like to be, this is going to be our opportunity to kind of look at what you need to do to be successful in the program. 
um, as well as your clinical evaluations to see what your performance is like. So when we get that schedule out for your practicums, I will be there um, also to pull you into the office so that we can have a sit down one on one. Got it? Any questions about the material that I just delivered? I just had one question. Is it, is it safe to say that denser materials or denser tissues are going to have higher atomic numbers? No, not necessarily because you can go into thickness. So okay. if you have someone who is higher thickness, mm. you know, uh, whether it's someone on steroids, thicker muscles, or, or someone who is more obese, you're going to have denser or a harder time for the photons to pass through. So layering superimposition is also going to play a factor later okay yeah but That's if you're it. talking about in comparison to tissue types denser tissue types are going to have higher probability of photoelectric absorption okay so if, if we're from that perspective like like a bone bone is a denser tissue that you know uh, yeah you don't need to have a lot of bone to absorb not in our diagnostic range, but if you put more muscle on top of muscle, kind of like the heart that we just looked at on that radiograph, it kind of gave the same shades of appearance as bone, even though we're not talking about calcium, we're talking about muscle with fluid, so it has the ability to absorb more photons, almost equivalently like the scapula did in that radiograph. Let me show you. So see how the same shades right here, even though it's brighter right here, we know we had more absorption. But if you look at this and you look at this, it kind of gives you the same appearance. But we know that this is not tissue. This is bone. But because muscle is thick and it also has a, a sac of fluid, it is going to have absorption, um, interact absorption possibilities as much as this bone. So it's safer to say denser tissue has more probability of absorption. But then when we get to thickness, it's also going to, depending on, it doesn't matter if it's uh, fat or if it's muscle, the thicker it's going to get in layers, the more uh, probability of absorption. So I don't want you to say how thick something is. I want you to say how dense it is, how compact it is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ms. Laura, I have a question, um, kind of sort of not related to the topic. So going back to the image where you, it was the jug pe pellets, and so the x-ray machine, the one where the, the person was uh, had pe uh, drug pellets in, the, in their abdomen? Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, the x-ray machine that they use for that, um, is it still going to be... Um, the Compton interaction and the the co it's not the coherent the um, the classical interaction. Classical is not going to give you an image. It's I mean, sorry, the Compton and the uh, photoelectric. The photoelectric, yeah. Yeah, we can see it right here. So, what is what is the appearance of Compton? Compton is going to give us everything that's gray. So, mm -hmm. how much gray do you see on this radiograph? A lot, okay. right? So, we know that there's a lot of Compton interactions. Well, what is photoelectric absorption? What color is this, Amy? White. White. So we know photoelectric absorption is happening here because we see white appearances. We, we see that. We see that white, bright appearances here. So we know photoelectric absorption is happening. And we also see transmission. We see darts. We know that this is transmission because of these radiolucent gas that's allowing our x-rays to pass more. So we're going to get into Compton scattering appearances, but do we see them? Do we see the interactions? Absolutely. We see the interactions where everywhere we see bright, we know that that's photoelectric absorption. When we see black, we see transmission. If we see anything in between, it's going to be Compton. So here, transmission, transmission, some transmission, and definitely some brightness. We can see some absorption. We see photoelectric, photoelectric, and definitely some photoelectric. So all of these, are, these two types of interactions happen simultaneously at different parts of the image receptor. So whether the here we're having less photoelectric absorption, because we know that this tissue is very less dense, 
bright or radial lucent. But we know this tissue is very dense, so we know that we should have more photoelectric absorption. Right? Is that making sense? So you can see the interactions based on the colors that are being revealed. And that's where I want you to go with. When do I see photoelectric absorption? Well, when I see the outline of bone, because bone is the most dense tissue inside of our bodies. Unless she swallowed something or something was placed inside, then obviously this is a higher brightness than this. The photons interacted here by giving up all of their energy in, in this with this object. Make sense? Hello? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I wasn't sure because my wife said launch your, I'm like, did you talk it off? <laughs> okay, so is that making sense to you? So can I see photoelectric absorption right here? What is this? Yes, absolutely. High brightness. Oh, I know that's a metal. It's actually magnets, but it's still high metal right here. And so we're able to see how many and where they're located because of the way that the x-rays are interacting with those items. Okay, so I know it takes a lot to wrap your head around it, but you cannot stop reading. So take the information that I've delivered today and read it and make sure that you understand it because it's about concepts. It's not about memorization. Okay, okay? and if you're thinking, I can't learn this, you're absolutely wrong. You can learn it. Okay, it just takes putting into steps. Ms. Lara, really quick. So Compton gives us all gray. Transmission gives us dark. Dense is more for electric absorption. And then anything in between will be, um, that's where I kind of get confused. Anything in between. Okay, so, okay, as Betty. Because you said three, two colors, but you didn't say them all. Transmission gives you what color? Dark. What color is that? Black. Black. Okay, good. What does absorption give you? White. Okay, good. Everything in between that? What is what? What is in between black and white? Gray. Okay, great. That's Compton Interactions. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Okay. So, I'm going to let y'all go. you have any other questions? I'm tutoring today. So far, I have two people signed up, so I still have room for a couple more. If you guys want to come with me, that's fine. I'll be there. Um, but just make sure that you let me know you're coming so that I can tell you, uh, tell you if I'm going to stay past a certain time. Okay? Come with your questions, please, if you decide that you want to tutor. This is not about opening the book and starting over. Okay? Have your questions. All right, guys. I have no other questions. I'm going to go ahead going once before I get off. Going twice. Okay. Yeah, have a good one.